God bless you guys, it's good to be here. Um, it's all quite close, isn't it? It's, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sitting, I've got a dog running under my feet a minute ago. That's all right. It reminded me of being in church in the Philippines. It was a bit like that. There was like dogs and things running around me then. It's uh, great. Um, so it's good to be here. Um, I, yeah, it was better than yesterday. Yesterday was a bit of a disaster. Um, I think in all the years I've done mission work, it's the first time I've arrived and not done anything, but it was just so windy down there. It was kind of pointless, wasn't it? It was yeah. like, in a minute, the tent is going to get blown away. So, um, it did. It, did, it did get blown away. It was, it was, I knew it was getting, I thought I was going to get blown away, but it was sort of, such a contrast from uh, the previous year, wasn't it? So, um, let's open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Who has Bibles nowadays? Do people still carry Bibles? <laughs> A lot of people use their phones now, don't they? Yeah. I'm always tempted if I use my phone, I might start answering emails and texts and, and things like that. Um, so I'm looking at chapter 12, Matthew 12. So if you don't know um, anything about me, I come, I'm part of an organisation called Tough Talk. Tough Talk is a, a, a registered Christian charity, and um, we and I see the T-shirt on your brother. I love it, and uh, I've got a Tough Talk member in the in the in the crowd. Uh, so Tough Talk um, travel up and down this country, and, and we've had the privilege over the years of travelling to different countries, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we go into prison schools. We work the, with the army and uh, the navy and all that kind of stuff. So next week I'm uh, in Norwich. And uh, I'm going to be working in a drug rehab. I'm doing a street outreach with a church in Norwich. And then I'm in a prison on the Sunday. So I get involved in all sorts of kind of interesting places to share and preach. And uh, sometimes I find myself uh, at the end of a, a, a church fate um, after the, the puppet show or something, you know. And uh, another week I find myself in a football stadium in front of 20,000 people. So I go from uh, t- after the Morris dancers one week to preach in front of thousands the next week but uh, any opportunity I get to share the gospel I consider a privilege I believe that it's a privilege to be used by God to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ it's the power of God unto salvation with that in mind I remember a time I was very much ashamed to be associated with being a Christian or Christianity And I'm going to bring a little bit of that out in a minute. But let's uh, look at the scripture I want to read from. It says here in Matthew, uh, this is Jesus speaking in Matthew 12, 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh for after a sign. And I say there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented they, they repented the preaching of Jonah and beheld a greater one than Jonah is here. Amen. So I remember literally um, uh, when I came to faith, I, I think the I, I went to a church in Canning Town uh, in East London. I wasn't a Christian at the time. And I went to this church and they were waiting. It, it was like in a school building. It was a bit, a bit bigger than this, but it was this kind of environment. And uh, they were waving flags and doing the dancing thing. Uh, and making. I mean, I remember this song they used to sing, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and they are saved. Anyone remember that one? And, and, and it, I, I used to hate that one because... <laughs> They used to do all this dancing with it and stuff. And uh, do you remember that strong tail? Who remembers it when they used to do the, the, the hand motions? Do you remember all that? Do you still do it? Is that one you got planned, is it? And, uh, <laughs> and they do that, and then they used to sort of dance up and down, didn't they? And then, and then when they got the saved bit, they'd go, wee! And, uh, and I used to sit at the back thinking, I'm not going to get involved in all this. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, uh, 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 and then they would sing a, a song about um, uh, Jesus being higher and higher and Satan lower and lower. You ever that one? The name of the Lord. No, no, I forget. Anyone know what to talk about that song? And it's lower and lower, isn't it? And, uh, and I'd be the only one still standing there because as they were doing Jesus lower and lower, they'd all be dancing down. And I'd be looking around. I'm the only one still upright, you know? So I don't do the dancing thing very well. You won't see me dancing this morning. By God's grace, something miraculous happens. But uh, I, I, and I, I, I was a bit, 
I didn't like Christians very much. I remember sitting there thinking they all looked a bit brainwashed. Like they're all so happy this time in the morning. How do they manage that? And uh, I was trying to figure out this whole Christian thing and I hadn't had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. It helps when you meet him. Yeah. When he comes and dwells in our hearts, the Bible says he'll turn our hearts of stone into flesh and pour his spirit in there. When you encounter God and you know him, it all makes sense why people are happy and why people are dancing and people want to celebrate Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about religion, is it? And religious ceremonies. It's about getting to know him. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the joy starts to bubble up within you and you can't help yourself but want to praise him. The sons of God are led by the spirit of God. And the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God, we want to cry, Abba, Father. And I remember when I came to faith, I just started to praise God and realise that I was born again, not because of any religious stuff, but I just sensed it in my heart because I knew him. The Bible says, the God who commands the light to shine out of darkness will shine in our hearts to give us the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We're born again. The face of God, of Jesus, is imprinted in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith we're saved not by works lest anyone can boast and I remember I remember as a young man sitting in church and, and not sure at, at what was going on and, and being embarrassed and making vows I was never going to come back again something kept drawing me back to this place in Canning Town and I'd had these dreams about God and I seldom share this part of my testimony really but I, I, I remember there were nightmares and these nightmares were haunting me. Well, they were nightmares of me going to hell. And I was like, what is this? And I remember waking up one night and uh, my wife who's with me now, she grew up in a, a Christian home. And she wasn't dragging me to church or talking to me about Christianity ever, really, never. But this one night, I remember waking up and told her about these nightmares. And she said, maybe we should pray. I said, will it take away the nightmares? Like, I'm going to hell. And so we prayed a prayer. And... Uh, uh, and I kind of forgot about it because the nightmares finished and I kind of put it to bed and I didn't really give it much thought. And I was training at a time in a gym in East London uh, with a load of gangsters that were running around in East London. And I, I was training this gym in Stratford. And uh, I remember in this particular gym, there was, uh, 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 there was all sorts of characters there that were straight out of the movies. They, in fact, they write movies about these fellas now. All the Rise of the Foot Soldier stuff. It was all these guys sitting around this gym and we were sitting there. And there was a guy there called Colton Leach. And Colton was very uh, famous at that time, uh, uh, it is more nowadays, for that kind of world he's from. And his dad, Norm, used, him and Colton used to sell, his, him and his dad used to sell the jacket potatoes and the chicken uh, in the gym. And we used to eat and have protein shakes in the gym. So I'd have a workout, and I remember I was sitting here having a, 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 I'm having a jacket potato and a bit of chicken and, uh, a, a, and, uh, and have a protein shake. And my wife was with me because she used to train at the time. And there was a young guy there that, that was the brother of the, the guy who owned the gym. The guy who owned the gym, his name was Angelita Lester. And Angelita Lester, Angie we used to point, was a, a British European and well uh, bodybuilding champion. And uh, I, I remember we were, I was sitting in the gym eating my chicken and uh, uh, his younger brother, his name was Javier, Hubby, we used to call him Hubby, he'd become a Christian. It got saved at a Billy Graham conference, or uh, 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 you know, when Billy Graham used to come over, he got saved there. And he was running around the gym telling all these gangsters they were going to hell. <laughs> and I remember I wasn't taking much notice of it, and I was eating my chicken and all that. And, uh, and, and I can remember uh, literally um, one of the guys I was with turned around to, his, uh, to, uh, to Angie and said, Can you shut your brother up? It's getting like. <laughs> It's getting a bit much now, isn't it? Can it and, and the only way he was getting away with it so long was because, like, who he was and who he was associated with. And Angie was, like, put in a bit of a position. And then um, my wife, who was with me, said, Oh, oh, she looks, she went, uh, she went, Ian's a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and the chicken in my throat just got stuck, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I'm a Christian, and people were, um, and people were looking at me like you're a Christian. And I'm like, and I, I realised that moment 
I was embarrassed to be associated with being a Christian. I, I never really gave it any much thought before then, but it just suddenly hit me that, uh, and I'm like, and I remember uh, Javier uh, pulling me aside and saying, you're a Christian. I said, well, no, I don't know about that, you know? <laughs> I prayed a prayer, I don't know why. In fact, I was acting worse at that point than any time in my life. I was using more steroids and getting involved in more violence. So no, I wasn't a Christian. I hadn't met or encountered Jesus Christ. But I kind of in my head had been trying to work out God. And I was coming to the point and the conclusion that there must be a God. And, and, and literally, I didn't really know how to answer it. And I ends up, I'm talking to Javier, and uh, he said, you know, a church I'm by. I told him to the church I've been popping into. And Javier um, is a good friend of mine to this day, and he actually, I'll be, um, he, he runs, uh, he set up a, a, a chain of Team Challenge, uh, which is a drug rehabilitation center that I'm going to be speaking at next week. And uh, I've seen thousands and thousands of men turning from drugs and alcohol addictions through Javier's ministry through Teen Challenge. And it's amazing how God weaves and networks people together, isn't it? How if I sent him, I told him about this church that launched him into his ministry. I was just thinking this just then, uh, only a couple of years ago, I'm speaking to my brother there on a Zoom call, and he was talking to me about I can't get his head around God, and, and our last summer, how me and Joe ducked him in the sea and baptised him. And then I come back a year later and he's telling me he's just come from a mission in Kenya. <laughs> It's incredible how God works, isn't it? And, uh, and we were sitting on, I'd love to say it was like the beach, I don't know what it was yesterday, it was like wind, that's all I know. And uh, getting blown along, I was hanging on to my, I had a, he bought me a cup of coffee before I'd got halfway, it was freezing. That's how cold it was there, it was like, I better throw that away. And uh, we were talking about people just walking past, oblivious to the fact that there's a heaven, there's a hell, there's a God. And we were saying, but you know, God has, we've, has given them the witness of creation around us. That if we look about us, we can see that he is real, that there's a designer who's created all things. And if there's a designer, there is a God. And if there's a God, find him. He's within him. We live and breathe and, and, and he had, have our being. He, we literally, he's there. If we will reach out to him, man is without excuse, the scriptures tell us. I believe with all my heart that God has not finished with the UK. He is bubbling and the times around us are moving and things are changing and the world's losing its sanity. Bless this young man. I would not want to be his age living in the environment he's living in with the madness that's going on, that's going through his and his uh, peers' head about the ideologies of the world around us. The world's losing its, mad its sense. Why? Because I believe that Jesus is coming back. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. The scriptures tell me he's returning. And you can only but just feel how close that is the more you look around the world around you and look within the scriptures. Jonah was a prophet of Israel. And he literally uh, uh, had been preaching. That was his mission to the people of Israel. He was not interested in going and preaching to a godless bunch of heathens in the Nevi'ah. He was a prophet you find in Second Kings. He had a, a reputation. He was a preacher. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, but he finds himself literally uh, 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 hiding and seeking and going in a different direction to Joppa, I believe, or Tarnish or something like that. One of those areas he goes off to on a boat. And uh, I'm not going to read through Jonah, but we know the story, most of us, don't we? And, and to be honest with you, I remember as a, a, a young Christian, I remember like sitting in church thinking, I don't know how much of this I can believe. You know, like, I believe in the cross. I believe in the crucifixion, the resurrection. It's hard to get my head around the return of Christ. I can't picture him coming through the sky. It's so difficult. I can't even understand heaven that well. But, and, but some of these miracles in the scriptures, they're kind of hard to understand, aren't they? A, a fella gets swallowed in a big fish. I had pictures of Pinocchio, you know, sitting there in a 
You know what that one, you remember when you're a kid and he gets swallowed with his dad, I think, doesn't he, in the wire when he's sitting there having a, they're having a little picnic, aren't they? And you've got a little fire going on in the belly of the whale. And, uh, and that's when I'm reading this. I, I, and in fact, to be honest with you, because I, I didn't know anything about the scriptures when I came to faith, I bought a children's Bible. My daughter was about five years old. And I used to read her the, the illustrated children's Bible so I could catch up a little bit <laughs> with what was going on. And, and again, I'm looking at Jonah and the fish. I'm thinking, is this real? But I remember one day just having to come to my senses and say, if God says it, it is real. If, if he's able to create the wonders around us, the scars, the stars and the skies and the heavens and the earth and the, the DNA and the complexities of, of organs and atoms. And if he can put life, uh, life together in such a way, he can interrupt the normal course of events. And we can have the supernatural. Who believes that God is supernatural? Amen, Amen to that. <laughs> Chapter two of Jonah, if anyone wants to get in there. Chapter, chapter 2 of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. I cried. And thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep of the midst of the seas, and the floods come past about me. All the billows and the waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again towards your, thy holy temple. The waters have come past around my soul. The depths have closed around me. The weeds are wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain, the earth with her bars was all around me forever and ever. Yet it has brought up my life from corruption, O oh Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, my prayer came unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay all that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. When I think about the sign of Jonah, I look within the story of Jonah with a reluctant preacher wanting to be told to go and preach to a, a, a people that he had no interest in. For 23 years, I've preached at the Notting Hill Carnival with a church called Kensington Temple and we construct a big stage and we stand out and literally there when you say a lot of churches say there's thousands coming past KT it, you know the carnival is like the biggest European thing that goes on and we're talking hundreds of thousands they talk about millions of people walking past down that road past KT and I spent uh, the two two days for 23 years standing out there preaching Jesus Christ crucified resurrected I was there last year and it was like hell on earth I hate the carnival personally I don't like the atmosphere and last year was the most hedonistic wicked place I've ever seen it was nothing but gyrating and madness and drugs and violence and everything was kicking off. But I loved the opportunity of preaching Jesus. I loved the opportunity of sharing, even though you feel like you're at the gates of hell. And nothing in me wants to make me get up on a nice bank holiday and go down to the carnival with all the madness that's there. And I can't explain when you're there for like 14 hours how depressing that can become. And yet I know that God is with us when we're there preaching. I remember one particular year, we just finished, it was like about 10 o'clock at night now, and everything had shut down, the carnival had finished. But for whatever reason, the DJ at KT had carried on playing gospel music. So what they do is they play like gospel and, 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 and tracks and stuff like that. And, and, and he'd been playing this Christian gospel music. And, and, and the, the evangelist there, his name's Christian, came to me and said, Ian, we've got so many people outside, like a sea of people, thousands all dancing and singing and we've got the police telling us we've got to shut this down he said do you mind preaching the gospel to them it's 10 o'clock at night 
There's drugs and drink and things that you don't want to look at everywhere. And I'm thinking, I don't really want to, no. Uh, I said, Christian, look, I've done a lot today. My voice is gone, I've had enough. Do you know, he said, please, Ian, it's such a good opportunity. I remember getting up on the stage and literally I, could, I looked down that, I think it's Lambert Rover or something like that. I looked down that street, I just could not see anything but faces, dancing, spliffs and joints and drink and all sorts of stuff. And I remember thinking, how do I do this? And uh, Lord, help me, speak through me. I've got nothing to say. And I remember literally standing up and, and starting with someone like, hey, this is Kensington Temple. We've been told we've got to close this down. And then I started to go into quickly a testament. And then I preached the gospel. And I thought, do you know what? I'm getting away with this. People were just standing there like shocked. All I could see was this geezer with his, with his spliff in his hands, looking at me with his beer like, is this a joke, mate? You know, like... <laughs> What the heck's going on? And, uh, and I remember thinking, I should really wrap this up while I'm still in one piece, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and then I said, you know what? If you want to receive Jesus Christ, he can, you can turn your life, repent of your sins, and come to faith in him now. I thought, I've got this file, might as well carry on. So I said, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm telling you, it was like London. I've never seen such a crowd of people. And the only things I could really see, apart from the sea of people, was the, the police on horseback. And the, the police there wanted us to shut it down. Down, you know, and uh, I remember praying a prayer uh, of repentance, and uh, I said, "We've got Bibles here. Come and get your Bible if you want. If you if something's happened to you tonight, God bless you. I'm going. I thought, get off my seat." <laughs> We had a loads of people coming forward. One young girl came forward with tears in her eyes and said, I don't know what happened when you prayed, but something hit me. I, I feel there's something tingling all over me. What is happening? You have tears in her eyes. You know what? It is, even though it, you, you, you're reluctant to want to share your faith, it's essential you share your faith. In whatever way that God has given you the capacity and the ability to do it. I have no skills. I'm not a preacher as such. I've got no doctrines or degrees behind me. But I'm prepared to open my mouth. That is it. I don't know what I'm going to talk about most of the time before I start talking. I just am prepared to open up my mouth and allow the Lord to speak through me. I bumped into a young lady about four years ago who told me she came to faith that night in that crowd at Kensington Temple. It is possible. We live in a supernatural world. In Jonah 2, we see Jonah declaring he's in hell. I believe that Jonah naturally passed from this earth and his soul and his spirit found himself deep in the bellows of earth in hell itself because that's what the scriptures say. And I believe from hell, not sitting on a little boat having a little picnic, not really physically alive, but his body was intact, I suppose, somehow being preserved from the, the digestive enzymes and whatever was going on there. But from hell itself, he's crying out to his saviour, to save him and rescue him. I believe Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost. It says in the book of Hebrews, to the very uttermost he's able to save. Jesus pointed to this and said, you perverse and wicked generation, only the sign of Jonah will be given to you. The sign of the resurrection and the ascension is all we need. We live in a dark place. You know how blessed it is preached in Kenya and different places around the world. If you can share your faith in England, you can share it anywhere. I read recently that England is rated in the top five of the most atheist nations in the world between North Korea and Japan. That's saying something, even France and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, are, 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 we've got more atheists than them, you know? We're, we're right up there. We are, a, we're, people talk about a post-Christian nation, we are an anti-Christian nation, actually. Mm. And when I look around at all those hundreds of thousands of people yesterday, well, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands, there were a lot of people there. As I was walking around, I got stuck here. I parked 10 minutes up the road, I couldn't get down the road. I don't believe in him. There's a lot of people floating around. And I'm thinking, where are they going? And praise God, this is a light in the darkness, this church. The seaside 
churches up and down this country, it's tough on them. And seaside towns have it rough with the gospel. That is the truth. But something is happening here. There's an excitement here, isn't there? There's a passion for the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is a light to all those people that are out there. Like a sign of Jonah, because you believe in the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's imperative that we proclaim the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. In whatever way you can do it, if it is a little prayer for a teacher, or whatever is a teacher's sister, isn't it? You're teaching my life. Yeah. See, I told you, don't do your phone, you go and WhatsApp. You listen, don't listen. Oh, yeah, right. Is it, is it, is it at the teacher you pray for teachers? I do. Yes. I've got a back one. She was WhatsApping someone. She was. Oh, yeah, yeah. I believe you, I believe you. I, I've sat in the back of churches and watched what goes on with them phones. It's probably better than falling asleep when the preacher's preaching, isn't it? Uh, whatever way and opportunity the Lord gives you, I remember, uh, and I believe that we live in a supernatural world, as I said at the beginning. The Bible says, fix not your eyes on what? is seen but what is unseen what is seen is temporary what is unseen is eternal i was at a meeting a little while ago and uh, i'm going to finish in a minute i was at a meeting a little while ago uh, down in cornwall and i had a, it was a big church and uh, i had a book still i've got a couple of books there. i've got four, five books i sell them for a tenner there you go oh look there you go back. she's back with me look she's waving them now and uh, if you want a book you can have one of my book with my story and i bought a couple in and i've got some forms there if you want to support tough talk there's a couple of forms there and, and i was at this church and i was selling the books and i laid out the table really impressively because i think my wife val was there and she'd help me with the i'm not really good at all that setting things up and uh, and so we had books and we had t-shirts and all that sort of stuff and there was a guy came over to me and he said you know what? i heard you preaching this morning and i was make i decided as i was driving in today this was my last time coming to church i have enough of church he said i consider myself a christian but I, i've been coming here a year and i just dread it every week he said but you make it sound interesting like something going on there. He said, what am I missing, mate? He said, and I, I'm looking at him. He's a, he was a tall guy and he had his family behind him. And I said to him, look, my friend, what I think is you need to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. I think maybe. He said, no, I've done that. I prayed a prayer of salvation. I said, yeah, well, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about making him Lord over your life. Making him Lord of your life. I said, I think it will just touch something different, something in your heart. You need to really know Christ. You really know, need to know the power of God. And I said, uh, uh, I said, look, can I pray for you? He said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I said, well, we'll pray now. Yeah, let's pray. And so I've got um, someone asking me about how much the books are. I said, don't worry, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm just going to pray for this guy. And uh, his wife and his kids were standing behind me. And I said, look, I want to pray a prayer of just asking Jesus, making him Lord of your life. Just follow me in the prayer and he started to follow me I started to pray uh, and lead him and saying Jesus I make you Lord and he said Jesus I... <clears throat> oh, that's not what I was expecting <laughs> he's got, I said uh, yeah Jesus I make you Lord of my life <clears throat> and he's collapsed into my shoulder his head's now there and uh, um, and his wife stepped back she's I'm looking at his wife she's what's going on with him what's going on with him and he's suddenly crumbled on my shoulder and I, I'm like and now he's growling uh, and swearing in my ear under his breath. And I'm saying, well, Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm not coming out of him. I'm not coming out of him. I said, well, I'm telling you, you are. And I'm looking at his wife because I'm smiling at the wife. She's wondering, what the heck's going on? And I'm saying, I said, you are coming out because he wants to make Jesus Christ Lord. You see, we live in an invisible world. And we live amongst principalities and powers. There is a God and the God, our God is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says where the Holy Spirit is, there is liberty. The difference between liberty and freedom is freedom. We're all, we can be born free, but liberty, you're set free, you're made free. You're free through liberty. And this guy is growling and dribbling at me and, and, and literally making a mess on my top. And telling me about Lucifer and all sorts of things and that, binding him in Jesus' name and telling him why I'm smiling, he's coming out because this fellow's making Jesus Lord of his life. It's life or death, heaven or hell, it's a reality of what we're involved in, folks. Whether you like it or not, Billy Graham said, Christianity isn't a, a, a game of patter cake in the playground. 
It's a war zone. It's a conflict. And this guy's dribbling on my shoulder, grappling in my ear, and I'm binding him in Jesus' name. This fella here is still saying, well, how much if I buy two books, mate? And I'm like, it's a power, I'll be with you in a minute, you know? And, and he gets a fist, he starts to look like he's going to ram his fist in my stomach. And I, I, I'm thinking, I'm binding him even quicker now. I'm thinking, I, I, he's a big fella. I don't want to get punched in the stomach on a Sunday morning if I can help it. I said, in Jesus' name, I command you to come out. I said, in, I said repeat after me, Jesus Christ is Lord. He said, Jesus Christ is Lord. And with that, poof, he sort of burped and, and, and shook a lot and, and collapsing on me. And I'm picking him up. I'm holding my sat on a chair there. He's sweating. The wife's thinking he's having a fit. She's never seen anything like this before. What are you doing to my husband? I said, he's okay, he'll be alright in a minute. I said, look, I'll come back and speak to you in a minute, brother. I, the pastor was off that day, and I didn't know who the world, who to come over and pray with him. I said, I'll be back in a minute. I quickly went over and, because I can't miss an opportunity, I flogged a few more books quickly. <laughs> and there was a queue building up now, you know. And, uh, and so we got rid of the books, and I came back and ministered to him, and prayed with him. And I was speaking in that church in the, on their Sunday afternoon service, and when we went for something to eat, when we got back, he was the first one there and he had a brightness in his face and said I feel like a fog has lifted from my head a darkness has gone off of me he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords he is able to conquer darkness cannot stand in his place we're serving a living God no matter what the world looks like around us and how dark the culture seems to be and how perverse and weird it seems to be in its faults and its ways he is true he is the way the truth and the life you can trust in him that when he said this perverse generation will see the sign of Jonah, we will see the, re the, the witness of the resurrection. It says in Zechariah 12.10 that those that pierce me shall mourn. We shall see his return. I believe it with all my heart that when I pass on this earth, I will be with him. Not because of good stuff I've done, but because of his grace and his mercy and his love. It's a fight, a physical, spiritual fight between principalities and powers. But we have the victor on our side. Let's bow our head, close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I'm going to pray a prayer. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, I'm going to encourage you to pray this out after me. It's a prayer just saying, you know, I've been coming, you know, maybe you've been coming to church, maybe you're just backslidden, I don't know where you're at. Maybe it's the first time you've really thought about the gospel and how real it could be. But let me tell you, it is the most important message you are ever going to hear. And maybe you've heard it today and you think, you know, I might pray that prayer, or I might sort this out later. There may never be a later, but hold, now is the day of salvation. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's is eternal life. All have fallen short of God's standards. Not any religious amount of coming to church, setting up PAs will do it. No matter how nice you are, how kind you are, none of that cuts, cuts the grade. The Bible says our best efforts are like filthy rags before our holy God. We are uh, in, 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 before him, the Bible says we're objects of wrath. We're, we're in serious trouble because all our ways have been motivated by our own self. We've made ourselves gods of our own life. And to make him Lord is letting him replace you on the throne of your heart. And I want you to pray this prayer after me, church. And if you're praying it for the first time, you want to reconnect connect to God. Pray it out loud. So if you want to repeat this after me, pray it out loud, church. And if you're making this personal, Pray it out as well, and at the end we'll say amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus. You died for us. Forgive us of our sins. Everything we've done wrong. Come into our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.